that you are. <laughs> what was the question? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? It was, a, it was about us being an entertainment band. We're not just for entertainment. What is it we hope to do? Um, what is it we're trying to do? What you know? Why we're not just an entertainment band? I think that was what you were asking, wasn't it? Yeah. It's what? And you say it in better English, but yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't. But well, you can answer it now. I would have thought it was obvious. All <laughs> 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 well, those sort of, sorts of questions turning on themselves because you know, what is an entertainment band doing? You know, an entertainment band like ABBA and, and Bucks Fizz and, and the rest of them are operating in, in support of the status quo. Mm-hmm. So they're not just entertainment bands. Mm-hmm. You know, they're making a vast num- amount of money, which is provided um, by the state, by um, in, in broadcasting money and various other money that's extracted from people in, in this country and elsewhere to uh, support what's going on. So why are they pretending not to <laughs> not to be political bands? I think we are entertaining anyway. At least I hope we are. Otherwise no one will come and see us, would they? Well, there's entertainment and Yeah, I know, but you've got I mean you've got entertainment bands who <coughs> do nothing supposedly but entertain. But and you've got political bands who do nothing, as far as I can see, but ball the pants off most people. And you've got, I think, there are people who are sort of in between. I mean, I'd, there would be something wrong with what we put on if it wasn't entertaining. But anyway, it's got to do, there is something, uh, which, got, which has got some, well, this has got something to do with the lyrics, the things you say, mm. and the way you work, if we can call it work. But no more than anyone else does. I mean, all we do is sing about the things that we believe in and about the way we live. And I mean, as Pete said, I mean, all bands do that fundamentally. I mean, Mick Jagger sings about things he believes in the way he lives and it's blatantly obvious in the records that he produces, you know, I mean, so fundamentally there isn't really any difference. I mean, we're, we're singing about a decent way of living and people like Abba and Mick Jagger are singing about an exclusive way of living. Well, there is a difference, I think, because most <coughs> of those bands are manipulated by big business, which we're not. I mean, I don't know how much of those are actually believe in what they're singing in a, in a similar way to the way we believe in what we're singing about. I think by the time they get to that position, they do believe it. And the filters are, are not only on things that, you know, to, for, for a big business to be able to use those people, they have to be amenable, which generally means that they support the sort of ideas that... Um, big business does. Yeah, but there's a, I mean, there's an image which those people will conform to before they start, and I think the difference between us and, the, and them is possibly that we made up our minds, that we, we uh, had something to present, and that uh, we weren't interested in, pre- in presenting it that way. You know, and I think that most bands will conform to the image of what you're supposed to do to be a successful band. Um, before they even get into the uh, music business. I mean, you see cheap imitations of Mick Jagger and David Bowie everywhere. And that's, that's the difference. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, you know, that's the initial difference. I mean, there are now people who are copying the way that we do it.
for the, the way that they see us doing it, which is probably not the way that we do it at all. I still don't see there's any real fundamental difference. I mean, someone like Barry sort of set out to do something, and I don't think he's contradicted himself in really doing what he has done. Um, he's taken the channels that are available to him through sort of major record deals, and we've taken the channels that are available to us through creating our own record label. Yeah, it's just a superficial speaking. image, really, isn't it? I mean, I don't think that there's fundamentally anything different in the 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 content, all the presentation, is just a superficial image of cocaine and lights and parties and groupies and backstage and all that sort of shit. But I think that's the only difference between them and us. What was but the question, that, though? I mean, well, there wasn't a question, really. There wasn't. I mean, surely there isn't. I mean, bands represent their lifestyle. They? they are... No the question was the, yeah. the question was the difference between not the difference, but I think the, the fact that we don't present ourselves specifically as being entertainment. <coughs> but I mean, you could sort of say that films by people like Goddard aren't entertainment, and uh, that films like you know Apocalypse Now or you know whatever <coughs> Star Wars and things are entertainment. Whereas I mean, the only difference is that. Goddard attempts to entertain in an intelligent way, and uh, and people who produce things like Jaws um, attempt to entertain at a reasonably unintelligent level. I mean, fundamentally, any form of communication is an attempt to entertain. I mean, we need to define the word. I would have said that someone we? like Goddard and us is is doing it to help or in the hope that the people will think whereas the other is in the hope that people will not think you know will 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 it just fills in their thinking capacity for them well i think that's the difference well that's the definition of entertainment isn't it that people are entertained rather than invited to think but do you not think there's an awful lot of the sort of really super, what we see as superficial level does make people think, you know, it just makes them think in a different way. It makes them think, oh, I'd like to own a car or, you know, have a degree feel. I mean, it does make them think in their superficial way, just as people who are beyond us sort of um, would see what we do as utterly superficial and image-ridden and... Um, self-interested and self-promoting. I well, know it's sort of trying to take it away from us talking about ourselves, mm. you know, and I think that's true. I mean, I don't see where where any specific much different, you know, we can look down on certain forms of entertainment and say, oh, well, that's sort of trivial. But I'm quite sure that there are people sort of, you know, who work in certain fields who look down on us and say, oh, that's just entertainment and it's trivial. You know, and I'm sure everyone can defend the position that they take in terms of the pantomime that they play. Except that, uh, you know, people uh, are at least partly defined by the people who are who go along to see those people and, and the amount, um, you know, how flexible to ideas and how sort of radical the people are in an audience, which is why rock and roll has always appealed to the, you know, the people with small investments in society, because you know, those people are flexible enough to sort of feel it. You know, yeah, what about television though? I mean, that's the ultimate entertainment, isn't it? You know, and that's, that's organised by a relatively small group of people who well, for instance, people who present Crossroads or Coronation Street. I mean, that that makes that keeps millions of people in the same, keeps them in the same place. I wasn't disagreeing with that. I was saying, I was saying, in fact, the opposite. That if people are prepared to be affected by information uh, and to move.
Yeah, yeah but those people, I mean, the 55 million viewers a week or every day who watch Coronation Street, you know, are open to being affected by the ideas that are being presented in that, just, by, just the same as the uh, 200 people who come along to our gigs, so it's no different really, is it? Yeah, but I, I wouldn't say that, no. I wouldn't say that uh, Coronation Street and Crossroads <coughs> promote ideas or or any, you know, serial or anything like that, but rather than reinforce the old traditions. Well, yeah. like, pro like propaganda, because like in Crossroads there, you've got like Meg Richardson or, or, or whoever it is, you know, who's the sort of, you know, well-to-do mistress of the, of the camp, and then, you, and then you've got this other character called Ben, who's a farm mm. worker, you know, because Ben is not the one who's sort of got the car or anything, he becomes a sort of jokey figure who appears in the sun now and again, and, and on Coronation Street you had this episode where one of the blokes was working and signing on the dole as well at the same time and he got put it away for it mm. which was sort of probably end of saying you know because there was a, a lot in the papers at that time of like dole q um mm. scrounges yeah dole q scrounges doing mm. that sort of thing you know it was like telling people to stop it or this is, this is what would happen yeah but it's really closely controlled though that sort of entertainment isn't it i mean what uh What's his name? Len Fairclough. Just being given the kick. I don't think kick, isn't it? Just the French are going to know what we're talking about. <laughs> Len Fairclough. Monsieur Fairclough. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think like there's there's things that reinforce the accepted normality yeah. of life. Well, and I there are things, people who work in an area who try to offer something that, you know, that is new to, well, you know, a new way of thinking, a new concept, new. Uh, that are radical thinkers, you know, I, I consider that we are a radical band in that sense. Uh, Goddard's a radical filmmaker. You know, people that make Jaws or make Coronation Street or any equivalent in the French programs are reinforcing the normal way of thinking and living. And that, and people love it, obviously, because it's very comfortable. They're not challenged into areas that they don't understand. You know, that's why they're popular, that's why things like Jaws are popular. In people's fear, of you, you know, all the things that it plays on that, in that, uh, what's the word, is it? you know, that sort of sense of danger, but you're not actually in it. Precarious. Precarious. Vicarious. You know, a vicarious sort of uh, entertainment. Um, and then there's people that try to offer another reality or another people. Yeah, but I think there's a confusion here between we're jumping constantly from being the performer and talking about ourselves and the observed. Uh, in talking about other people and that uh, observed there are 200 vicarious punks who stand in front of us and vicariously um, take the thrills and the spills of their favourite rock and roll band in exactly the same way as the vicariously people sit yeah, in front of yours. I'm not denying that at all. Well I, I was just saying you know that jump, we can't to try and sort of make this um, sort of comments about entertainment. You know, we are entertainment in just the same way as anyone else. Well, you can't it? avoid that. I mean, we set out. Yes, but our aim is different, that. isn't it? I mean, what we're intent, our intentions are very different from the person who makes Jaws yeah. or yeah. you know such yeah. a film like that or a yeah. band like um, Bucks Fizz or whatever they are. I mean, our intentions are different, and surely that's what we're talking about, not what the audience, how the audience is taking us. I mean, they could no, look at a Goddard, couldn't they, and watch some sort of Goddard love scene and turn it into some, you know, sort of jerk-off picture. I mean, of course, you can't stop people interpreting it to their own lives. I mean, obviously, we are part, anything anybody does, no matter how profound it might be, is going to fall into that category also. We've always known that, anyway, as a band. One is fighting the pop image, the music image. And all the rest of it. You know, one of the reasons we did stop doing gigs last time was that, you know, that awful front row of people, you know, who are vicariously jumping up and down, mouthing the words and know nothing. You know, we don't attempt to understand what's around them. You know, they said it's the intention, which is the quality to the difference. 
I, I wouldn't just put it down to the front row of people and put it down to. I wouldn't well, do that. Because if I was at a gig, then you know, that was really happening, and I, I might want to partake in that form. I'll get down the front. I suppose all I was trying to qualify was sort of like people do things because they believe in it, you know, one way or another. I mean, the Beatles never intended to be the greatest rock and roll band, you know, that ever happened. They just enjoyed doing what they were doing. And because they were the people they were, they had the effect they had, you know. And I don't think, you know, it wasn't a sort of conceptualised thing. You know, it just so happened that, you know, they happened to like doing what they did, or they were doing what they did. And I sort of see it largely on that level. I mean, there's two levels within rock and roll, in, within entertainment as well, isn't there? There's sort of people like the Rolling Stones who were also just got together to do what they did. And then there's other bands that have been put together by the music business to just to make money. Well, I mean, everyone knows who they are, people like But I mean, if you compare Buck Fizz to ABBA, I mean, ABBA seemed to have a great deal of integrity compared to Buck's Fizz, because ABBA, you know, I mean, whatever values you might attach to what they sing about or their lifestyle, they're doing it because they want to do it or enjoy doing it or want to make a company or something. Because Buck's Fizz is an absolute piece of product where the music business said, how can we make money? We'll get these four people together make them conform to that, you know, and there's sort of, so there's all different layers, aren't there? Yeah, but for, I think from the other side of the coin, <coughs> there's a sort of misconception, <coughs> which has existed since the Beatles, you know, and the, the Beatles set off doing She Loves You and all that sort of stuff, and then started uh, making statements which were uh, attacking the state that they found themselves in, and that, and I think, I don't think the music business is going to let, will, will let that happen again. So I think that there are, I mean, there are a lot of, of people who think, um, okay, well, we'll join a record company because we can then fuck the system from inside, and I think that that's, I don't think you can do that. But in order to join the music business, it's learnt by its mistakes. Like this, with the Sex Pistols and everything, I don't think you can do that anymore. So I mean, it depends. I mean, if you are in the entertainment business, it depends uh, what you want to get out of it, as to what stance you make initially. And I think that you know, as we weren't interested in making any of the compromises that are expected of us by the music business, that's why we we started off doing it the way that we did it and that's now become a sort of an accepted way of doing it and then until we can find another way of doing it then we won't well we aren't we haven't done any gigs this year so that's why I, that's why I see I don't I don't think it was because of the people jumping up and down in the front row at all not so yeah. yeah I haven't done at all mm -hmm. I feel I, I felt there was more from you know, our point of view is that we weren't getting anything out of going around gigging because people just came along with preconceptions and it wasn't pushing us at all. Whereas, you know, initially when <coughs> we went in and, uh, you know, actually tried to speak to the people who had come along, then that was, uh, that was really exciting. But that's now become a sort of normal way of doing things, you know, and there are a million bands around doing that. And I mean, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but unless, but I mean, it just, it didn't become, it wasn't pushing us at all, was it? Well, no, not a million, all right. <laughs> Speak out, too low. 
No, I just I think that you know the way that we set out to do things has become as ex- an acceptable part mm. of the establishment as the way that uh, I don't know the Rolling Stones do it. Yeah, but surely they're stepping stones. Yes, I mean you know, people do maybe stop and talk to the others and treat them as human beings. You know, that's a good thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously one has to move add to that, but I mean that's a good step, I mean even if it does become uh, a, you know, a common thing, it doesn't make it bad, does it? I think what does happen is that if, if the, uh, you know, the whole idea of um, us being good at what we're doing and breaking down and attacking the divisions between uh, audience and band by saying that you know, we are you uh, worked because of our and was confronting because of how good we were because that that put the uh, onus on the on the people at gigs to to lift themselves or share part you know their their excellence and not their mediocrity. Um, whereas if you get sort of second and third generation um, bands which aren't that good as performers, they're generally pretty bad as performers, uh, doing it, then they are no different from the people who go along. Uh, they're not confronting because every, every, everything in the in the gig is mediocre. No, I don't. I don't agree with you because I mean I think that it's. Just, I just think there's been a standard which has been created by what we do. I mean, initially we set out to say, well, okay, you can go out and organise your gigs and put out your records and live your life in a way which is uh, is different from the way that we're expected to do it. I mean, and what and what has happened is that it's become. I mean, it's very easy for for people to sort of co-op that and to put it into a little compartment and say, oh yes, all right, <coughs> and you can do it the crass way, you know, and the crass way has become just the same as the uh, the Rolling Stones way. And that's that's all I was trying to say. Is that it's become it's just become sort of institutionalised, and that you know it is okay. You can go out and live your life, you know, the way that you want to live it, but there are a hell of a lot of pitfalls as soon as you start getting into an established um, form and an established way of doing it. Well, I don't think that necessarily the, uh, the established way of, the new established way of doing it is, is bad. You know, it's as good as any other way of putting on the gig in it. Um, is what people do with it and, and how much of a challenge they see that as being that, that has destroyed that form, not just because of people's expectations. I mean, people continually expect just to go on to another gig, and if it is just another gig, then you know that's all it is and nothing shifts. And if the people uh, don't use their imaginations and and create new things going on at gigs. Then, I mean, that's that's the failure. Um, people, I mean, people go on to gigs will endlessly fall back into sort of easy options. And whether, as they, as you say, there's sort of music biz or so-called alternative. Yeah, but it's not, but all I was trying to say is that it's not, I mean, the, the, there would be no point in going out to do a gig if we didn't feel that uh, there was some chance of effecting some sort of change through doing that. And I feel that people's sort of preconceived idea of what's meant to happen <coughs> nowadays is such that it's sucks off those things which were initially 
confronting. You know, okay, everyone, you, you, you go out to a gig and you expect to get at least two handouts. You expect to speak to three or four members of whatever bands were playing. Um, you know, you have all your uh, ideas confirmed and you go away again and nothing's fucking changed because, you know, it's, it's exactly the same as going along to a, a Rolling Stones gig and buying, you know, a Rolling Stones t-shirt and, I don't know, I mean, it just, it, that it just doesn't seem to, I mean, that gig the other night was different in that, you know, nobody knew exactly what was going to happen and I thought that, that was good. Um, you know, and a lot of people, could, you know, the, there are people who, who turned up at half past ten who I met outside and said, oh, we heard Crass were playing. You know, and, and I said, yeah, we, they've already played. And they said, oh, shit, you know, because they expected Crass to be playing last. And I thought, you know, I thought that, I thought that, that was pretty good, really. So, I mean, the only people, the people that we played with, who were, who played two with people who were, you know, actually interested in what was going, going on rather than just coming along to another gig. I think one has to be careful of um, the whole thing of so just because something's new and different that it's worthwhile because I don't think that's always the case you know I think obviously something if it's initially different and ex it's exciting that you know therefore it's exciting but it doesn't necessarily do that much more you know I mean like our early gigs for example and people didn't perhaps know what to expect and now they do um, I don't know that, that excitement from the fact that they didn't know what was going to happen was did much more for them than it would uh, than it would do now when they they know what to expect I mean I think you can sort of grow from there it's I don't think just changing and being different and shocking for just for the sort of hell of it in a way just because it's it seems it can seem more exciting but I don't think necessarily it is and I mean I think there's a lot of people who who've grown from that you know and I think there are well, yeah I think there are on the other on hand you know there were there were there were things that we were sort of hinting at five years ago which have now been made into major issues by uh, a lot of uh, bands who are around at the moment and have <coughs> and have become you know the whole that that scene has become really mm. polarised. Like there's a sort mm. of yes, I you mustn't eat me. meat, and you know, and you mustn't uh, yeah. do vivisection on animals, and you, you know, you mustn't mm. have bombs, etc. Which are all in themselves are all sort of very worthwhile causes, etc. But it's become so narrow-minded that when people go along to a gig expecting to be told I know. not to eat yeah. meat. You know, and it doesn't make any I agree with I mean I agree with that, but I'm just wondering if it was because if one was if they were presented, you know, like say five years ago or so, whether the reactions that those people would have had then to what we were doing would have been necessarily any deeper or, or if it just had more excitement to it. And I mean they they obviously started off they started to think about those ideas and, and they've become polarised and it's up to them really. I mean I don't know however many times we change our set and do things in a, in a different and more unusual way, it's still up to those people in the audience to um, sort of stop polarising themselves into... I mean, I mean, if we do something exciting and different, then they're going to polarise with that, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, that's breaking that, really. What I was trying to say is that you know the, peop the people who are doing that aren't, aren't, as far as I can see, it's not entertaining. That's not uh, entertaining at all. Whereas I think that there always has been an element of entertainment in what we do, in that it is whenever we go out and do something, we do uh, make a big attempt to make it exciting and different and I think that that's what isn't entertaining in what we do which is not entertaining in what a lot of other people do who are working in the same field as us. I, I, 
I think, as well as that. I mean, I, I don't know about that entertainment. I think one of the qualities of gigs up until recently has been one of celebration, which is one of the most potent forces on on someone coming to a gig and finding people celebrating something. Um, to as a as a way of saying, look, this is there's something worth having here. There's something worth uh, pursuing here. Um, and people can get the idea that they might be able to share in that, you know, if they're prepared to put the work into it. Because you know, something has been done. But the, the, there is no feeling of celebration. I mean, there, there basically isn't anything to celebrate. <coughs> Well, I think, yes, I think there is. I think there is something to say. Sorry? Well, if you don't understand it, I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think there is something to celebrate. I think there is something to celebrate, but I just think it's the way in which it's presented which has got to do with what we were initially talking about, because I think that a lot of people, you know, don't use their imaginations to present what they have to say in a way which is effective and entertaining. You know, it doesn't, to say something is entertaining doesn't mean necessarily mean to say it has to be a piece of shit, or it doesn't have to support the status quo. Because um, you, you can present the most radical ideas in an entertaining, exciting way, and therefore stand a, 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 cha a chance of them being effective. You know, and all I'm trying to say is that, like we said on the record, you know, how many more times do we have to hear rehashed versions of Feeding the 5000? Because that seems to be what's happening. We've seen, you know, I mean, the, a couple of those bands the other night seem to be doing something else, but that falls into different categories. I'm sure to some extent we're talking about our own sort of uh, shortcomings or um, problems in sort of pushing what we have largely been responsible for, if not you know, merely a part of creating, and that is the sort of alternative punk movement. And we've gotten to a point where um, you know we've said it all in one particular direction. I mean, you can't. There's no point in reiterating endlessly the same points, and I think that. <coughs> um, Given the Falklands War, you know, I think that the point has been finally and sort of, sort of magnanimously sort of banged on the head in terms of we can't really say much more about war and the blatant stupidity of it, and we couldn't have a better demonstration of the blatant stupidity of it. And what we're really talking about is having sort of raised consciousness of however many people to that point, and where the fucking hell do we go next? You know, we're not content with simply um, restating the obvious because we believe it has become obvious and so uh, I mean surely we're mainly talking about our own predicament and sort of seeing how we go beyond where we've got to. Um, yes, but isn't that what we're always talking about though? I mean I don't think that it, I think that there is a point in continuing to say since the Falklands War what is obvious because I mean it was only it wasn't until sort of a month ago that people started to appreciate the fact that there was a record that we put out along those lines. Yeah, well, we've well they were too done, frightened we to buy yeah, it. Yeah, we've already done that, haven't we? I mean, we've sort of done all that. You know, so people now recognising the fact we did it and we can, you know, got enough sort of whatever it takes to go along and get hold of the record and appreciate what it tries to say, all well, that's all well and good, but we've already finished with that, haven't we? Um, you know, to, to, in my eyes, to some extent, we had become entertainment over the last two years, in the sort of sense that um, that all entertainment's entertainment, in the sense that it was monopolised by people who identified with and and vicariously lived off of the energies of people like ourselves. Those who didn't were away somewhere else doing it themselves, you know, forming bands or doing magazines and might have been at the gig if they were either playing or handing out the magazines. Otherwise, generally speaking, it was increasingly becoming a sort of um, gathering of 
uh, people who who wanted to state an identity and very little else, in my view, because we have been to stable, we'd stabilised, polarised ourselves in a position for too long, um, or for long enough, or whatever. I don't know. Um, And all, I mean, what we, what the, the, the bands and the movement that we now criticise is actually, seems to be what we're talking about is just that which we want to leave behind, isn't it? Because we've sort of dealt with all of that. Which doesn't mean it's not relevant, because it is relevant, but all those bands can get on and do it, really, can't they? Do what? I'll just go on putting out the information about bombs and the deception. So that information has been redefined. And it's no longer. You know, they are just another band. And it's just more information rather than being uh, ground reclaim your information and put out fresh. Oh, I agree with that. But then if we see ourselves as being purely information, then that's what we were doing, isn't it? Mm -mm. But we weren't, though, and the, but that's what it's become, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's, right, that's what I was making. Well, I think it's a really difficult. Uh, it's a difficult time for us be, to be doing an interview because there is quite a lot which has happened over the last six months, which has meant that it's been more difficult to, for us to decide exactly what we should be doing, or whether if we do that, it's going to be effective. Um, what, how you measure whether you're being effective or not and whether the way that we choose to put things out at the moment is the best way to do it. I mean, I think that we'll always continue to, to be uh, radical, if that's the word that you want to use, but whether whether the way that, you know, the format that we've got at the moment is the most effective way of doing it. I mean, it Not, I mean if I were to interject again there, I mean, firstly, I don't think anyone chooses to be radical, because you can't choose to be radical, because you can't just be radical because you choose to be No, I said if that's the word that you choose to use, I didn't say if you choose to be radical, I said no, if that's no, the way that you choose to express yeah, but you what you said that doing. we'll always be radical, I mean, it might very well be that we are no longer radical, and it might not have been for two years for all you know, I mean, who, who calculates whether or not you're radical? You do yourself, and that's what I'm trying to say. I don't think you can do, because... Uh, I don't think sort of radical thoughts sort of are uh, conceptual in that way, are they? I mean, you don't sort of take up radicalism as a profession, do you? No, you don't. I mean, you don't go around, uh, you don't decide whether or not you're going to go around and stop being radical now and go and sort of uh, go and work on the crossroads team or whatever. You know, <coughs> I don't think that the people who, you know, the people in the band are ever going to be. Uh, join the army, or uh, support the status quo. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really don't, I mean, I sort of don't like much talking about the band anyway, because it's sort of, all, you, all we're talking about is our idea of it, and it's sort of, Basically speaking, we put out records and do gigs so that other people can create their ideas of it and of what we say. You know, talking about the band itself is sort of, sort of in some way, a bit irrelevant, isn't it? Okay. Well, I mean, that's why we're doing this isn't it? No, because we can talk about ideas. You know, which is not to do with whether or not we consider ourselves to be entertained. I mean, what, what, what no, that's why we're doing this, because we're a band. I mean, we wouldn't be doing it otherwise, would we? No, I agree with that. But, I mean, if you sort of say, D 
do you consider yourself to be entertainment? I mean, it doesn't make much difference whether you do or not, does it? Because it's what other people make of it that matters, isn't it? No, not necessarily, because I mean, you choose to you choose to express what you want to express, all the ideas that you want to put over, in, and you choose a format to put it over in. You know, and we happen to have chosen a band to put it over in, therefore we're seen as being uh, part of the music business. You know, and you get endless fucking stupid references to us in that vein in the music press, etc., etc., which is in terms of reference which we've got nothing to do with really. It's always by the way, really, because what we've always been primarily concerned with is ideas, though, isn't it? Yes, but you can be concerned with ideas, you know, and go and uh, live in a little house on the top of a hill miles from anywhere and still be concerned with ideas. Yeah. Well, we're banned because of the ideas. No, I didn't, no. Mm. <laughs> I don't agree with you. Can you fucking sit up there and think radical ideas until the cows come home? You know, but, you, but if you want to put them out, therefore, in the, in the, you've got to accept some established way of doing it. Yeah, but the point I was trying to make uh, is that you can't qualify that's i mean that was the predicament that pete was talking about you can't qualify radical ideas i mean it isn't it what might you might see as being a radical idea it might simply be an expression of your sort of intellectual inability i mean there's a lot of people who sort of got no sort of mind at all might think it's a radical idea to wear tight trousers instead of baggy ones, but socially it's not going to be a radical idea. And all I was trying to point out was that I don't think that the person who creates ideas is aware of the fact that they're creating radical ideas. They just do whatever they do. If it's picked up upon... I mean, I, could you qualify the difference between us and the UK subs? Really? You know, did you think that we were more radical than they were? when we used to play with them. I mean, I used to think we got different ideas to them, but the fact that we were a totally different, or were seen as a totally different force, was a sort of bit of a surprise to me. Yes, I would. Oh. And we did, as well. We did. They were I mean, very different from we the always used to, I mean, the, the kids that we I didn't to say do. whether we were the same. I was saying whether or not we were sort of a radical force. It's the sort of self-conscious idea of calling yourself a no, radical... No, I wouldn't... That's what I said. That's why, I, that's why I qualified using the word radical. I said, you know, I said radical, and then I said if you want to use that word. I mean, there are other... There are other words which you can use, but I mean, I think that we are, that, and we always saw ourselves as being completely different <coughs> from the UK subs. And why did we have those endless conversations with them after the gigs about uh, about the songs that they did and, wh and what they were trying to put over? Yeah, but the feeling that it was what Pete was saying was that whereas five years ago the things we were expressing probably were radical, um, there's no way of qualifying what the ideas we're expressing now are. And <clears throat> a lot of the ideas that we were expressing five years ago, which were then radical, are now commonly accepted. Mm you know, or seven years ago, like sort of peace movement and uh, animal abuse, sexism and things like that, which we brought up in songs seven years ago, were all uh, we were attacked for at the time, whereas now people would be liable to be complimented for. Um, and our job, it seems to me, is to sort of either just go on sort of singing about all those sorts of things or expressing some other new dimension. Because it was in those days a new dimension and it's caught up with us. 
and it's caught up with us you know, in terms of gigging and in terms caught, of yeah well it's caught up with us in the terms that have now become accepted that, you know that it's acceptable to go along and do a gig at the peace rally um, because you know mm. it doesn't really matter what you're singing about the fact that you happen to be there is good for record sales you know or uh, it's become acceptable, you know, to do uh, songs about Green and Common because, you know, Green and Common is a sort of acceptable media issue now. But I mean, what the way in which the way that I see that we were trying to put those ideas across even seven years ago um, and now is radically different from what the acceptable forms of the acceptable form of those ideas is now. And I think that, you know, what the peace movement is is about has got virtually nothing to do with what we talked about or what we are talking about. I mean, the peace movement has got to do with sort of left-wing politics and uh, badges and sort of social relevance. Um, it's got nothing to do with the way that people treat each other at home. You know, uh, the feminist movement seems to become sort of totally polarised and hasn't got anything to do with seeing people in a respectful way as individuals. Um, you know, all those so-called, all those issues which have now become socially relevant and acceptable don't seem to have made any fucking headline no, well, as far as I can say. So therefore I would, I would say that it's worthwhile <coughs> continuing with them. No, in, in the same way as we always have done. Yeah, but, by, but we would continue with them in, by sort of going in a totally different direction, wouldn't mm. we? Rather than just reiterating. And there's a point I was making was that is that there are lots of people now who can reiterate all those ideas and sort of introduce people to um, them who might not have been introduced to them. And our, our job is to sort of extend beyond that, which is. I mean, my yeah, I think we which is what I feel the reason for our not gigging has been. Well, all right, yeah, we'll, we'll extend beyond them, but we always have extended beyond what they are now being presented to us. I mean, you know, we never, we would never do a uh, gig which says, you know, which, or a banner which says, you know, if you eat meat, you're a stupid fucker, you know, which is what people are doing now. You know, I don't think the way in which you know, we've presented ourselves has ever been is the same as, as what people now see those ideas to be all about. No, I agree. Yeah. So from that point of view, I don't think I don't think that's a good reason for not going around and gigging. only because the super, superficial elements of the way in which we presented ourselves have now become commonplace that it seems worthless to do it. Well yeah, but to do it in that sense, we've had we have had demonstrated to us that the superficial uh, identity that can be created around the ideas that we were expressing can negate the expression mm -hmm. of those ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that so that the obvious job is to find a manner in which we can present those ideas, which, for the while at least, we know can't be superficially co-opted. Co yeah. So it seems to. I mean, that's why I. That's why I say that we weren't yeah. gigging was so that we could try finding some new expression mm. for our for those ideas. Mm. Oh what to do now fill up another side of that <laughs> <laughs> Not the same question please. <laughs> No, you'll have to ask some questions now. I can't think of a question. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Why did you want to interview us rather than <laughs> any other bands? No, I won't do it. <laughs> no. Not just because I played your records quite often and because I translated the, your lyrics mm. too because I was interested in what you say and because you wanted on the radio station you wanted to I wanted to in the program mm. to play other other bands that those that were usually listened to on other radio stations I mean uh, official radio stations because we are you know we can only listen to funky disco thing mm. um, who else do you play then pardon who else do you play apart you get subs thereby babes and to you know to to try to to make people think about what is being what type of bands can be heard or are putting out records or why are they doing this and what are their lyrics about in the society we live in, in the system I mean. Why do you play UK subs and test you babies? Because I can't play you all the time. <laughs> I mean the thing is, is it <laughs> but it's difficult for us to, to talk to sort of uh, to talk amongst ourselves about what we put out on records or at our gigs um, and get beyond merely talking about our idea of ourselves you know which tends to, I mean I think that most of the other side of the tape that you've got is really us talking about the problems that we find in presenting what we present not actually the ideas that we present mm -hmm. and unless there is unless you have an interpretation of what of what we say you know of what we're trying to do which we can then sort of play ourselves off against it's very difficult for us to to talk abstractly about those ideas because we've already um, to a certain extent presented an interpretation of what we see around ourselves mm -hmm. for people to appreciate or not to appreciate whether they like it you know, if they like it or if they don't like it um, that's fair enough but I mean if there's I don't see that there's much point in us purely talking amongst ourselves about the problems that we encounter uh, as as a band or as individuals without specifically relating it to the ideas that we're putting out because I mean otherwise it does tend to become a bit self-indulgent, and I think the other side of that tape is a bit sort of perhaps. Also, let's present your ideas then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's difficult for it's difficult just to say. I mean, you can't. Mm. It's difficult for us to play off against that when there's nothing specific being put in. If you see what I mean. I mean, I'm not. Uh, yeah. Do you understand trying. what I mean? What he's yeah. saying is, will you ask, ask a question, question please? <laughs> I don't know what to ask. Mm. Yeah, well, we don't know what, I don't know what to talk about. Well, I mean, first of all, <laughs> I, I asked you why you play the other band. Mm. Um, because we wanted to be different. I mean, when we, when we started this radio station, and when we started the, this, uh, what, what I call a punk program, was to um, it was our way to express ourselves, which was denied I mean, in general. What are you expressing if you, I mean, I don't, I don't know <coughs> what the UK the subs fight. are saying or the test tube babies are saying, I know what we're saying. Um, and but as I see the danger of, uh, of, of people on the continent taking English punk music and playing it fairly indiscriminately because it falls into no, it's, it's not indiscriminately because. Um, well, what discrimination do you use? Because when when a program is made, well, I I try to um, you know to oppose things and at the same time I present my own point of view. So it's 
Anyway, it's it's subjective. I I won't only play the UK subs or Pit in the Test Tube or GBH or you know only play the records. It's not only that. It's more than that because when we uh, decided to to start this radio station, we wanted to to create another way of living among because we're 50 people, so we wanted to create something else. So we each of us do it their own way. But as the language is different anyway, we've got to translate the lyrics. And so uh, uh, when you start translating the lyrics, it means that it's got to go a bit further because you can't translate. Right? I can't translate your, your lyrics without uh, talking about something else. It's not only a song then, because it's related to, I mean, our own life or our own ideas and our way of seeing them, putting them through. Well, I mean, if you're you must be aware that what the music business does um, when it sees people putting out ideas, it doesn't t attempt to buy those people out. You know, it doesn't attempt to buy the, sort of, the people who are who are saying things and obviously have their own integrity up. What it tries to do is um, is synthesise those people, you know, recreate them in a malleable form. Um, you know, it creates its own version of punk. You know, the commercial version of punk has got absolutely nothing to do with punk. Of course. Um, and now the alternative market is such a potent one. Uh, the same thing is happening in, in terms of, uh, sort of non-music business people synthesizing um, you know, what was punk and, and representing it and I just wonder how people who are not living uh, in Britain uh, evaluate what's actually going on how the people who say someone like the test tube babies relate to you know, what is happening or what has happened in Britain well, what I meant by punk was only to be different mm. And because we know the essence of our ideas, then we might feel that Peter and the test tube babies, whose, uh, who, whose essence we don't know about, you know, are producing inferior material to ourselves. Well, I mean, I've spoken to some of them, and I mean, I actually, I can understand why people see that in the same sort of light as what we do. I mean, just we might consider ourselves to be sort of superior in certain areas, but or, or Charlie, Charlie Harper. I mean, I don't, I don't expect the average audience to actually be able to define the difference between what we do or what Peter and the Test Tube Babies do. Why should they? They don't know the reason for the ideas. We're saying, fuck off the Queen, fuck off this, and Peter and Test Tube Babies sort of say, up your arse, or whatever it is. And it's basically just a form of sort of youth rebellion that is the major identity point for most people. I mean, the essence of the ideas is of very little consequence, isn't it? And people actually sort of shy away if you start sort of presenting them with the essence of ideas, you know, they tend to sort of not be interested, they don't really want to know that. So. <laughs> so in that case, there's no point in, uh, 
Now who, who do you... Now why bother to uh, perform anywhere? Well, yeah. because you believe in what you're doing. I mean, all I'm sort of... Uh, well, I mean, I would hope that people eventually, whether they shy away from it or <coughs> not, I mean, the fact that maybe they do, would shy away from something like, uh, yes, sir, I will, rather than... Um, the UK subs latest album. Um, maybe the reason that they do do that is because Yes Sir I Will does try and express ideas in a more, uh, you know, puts over their essence more than the UK subs do, which is why, um, maybe, which is why it's worth putting out things like Yes Sir I Will. I mean, maybe they don't, they don't conform to the idea of, I mean, the way in which we presented it doesn't conform to the prevailing idea of youth rebellion at the moment. But, uh, and maybe the fact that some people shy away from it is, uh, is good in that way. I, mean, I, know, I don't know of anyone who has listened to Yes, Sir, I Will and said they've actually enjoyed it. Whereas I should think most people enjoy, now enjoy feeding into 5,000, whereas when we put it out to begin with, nobody enjoyed that either, I should think. So, I mean, I think that, you know, there is a difference between, you know, I mean, I think you can latch on to a way of doing something which is initially effective and, uh, and flog it to death which is, uh, a, I think, a tendency, you know, which is what punk has become. I mean, punk is, is now become a standard, you know. Punk initially was a rejection of standards. It's now become a standard to which uh, bands conform in the way that they present themselves, in the way that they present their music, in the way that they write their lyrics. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, that there is a difference between people who uh, mindlessly conform to that way of presenting themselves and through and, and there's a difference between them and people who are trying to present their ideas in a in a different way you know which is more possibly more confronting I mean, you could, you could, we, I mean, we could, we could go on touring like the UK subs do, you know, endlessly. Because I mean, then there's nothing wrong with the fact that Charlie really enjoys playing every night. I mean, that's all he lives for, virtually. But beyond that, it's it's pretty pointless, isn't it? funny thing about, about this all is that you've been talking a lot and not, uh, not a word such as anarchy, peace of freedom that we can read on the lyric sheets have appeared in the conversation. I don't think there's any reason why they should do. I mean. Because obviously, if we're talking amongst ourselves, there are certain assumptions that we make and knowledges that we have that we don't need to reassert. I mean, we don't need to reassert our belief in uh, anarchy, peace, and freedom with each other because that's how we live with each other. So there's no point in talking about it, basically. Well, I mean, I suppose, suppose Reagan goes to bed saying good night and democracy to you, dear. And <laughs> 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 is that sort of, you know, <laughs> level of it? What I wanted to say is that maybe a French, a French audience listening to the interview 
uh, will listen to you talking together and may be surprised n not to hear a word of what, what they've read. Yeah, well, that's what I was trying to say earlier on, is that, you yeah. know, unless so that it's just going to become, <laughs> become self-indulgent, unless there are questions about uh, what do you mean by anarchy, peace and freedom, which is something that we've it's gone through endlessly. It's a good question, then you can stop talking no, about no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to be self-indulgent. <laughs> 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 Would you repeat it again, please? <laughs> well, I think that it's something that we've, you know, that, that we've tried to express so many different ways in the records, and uh, it, oh, we've got a handout on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the new triptych. What's that? Only keep peace and freedom. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean then? Much the same, probably. <laughs> it's not much of an answer. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, I think it's self evident. I mean, uh, Try to explain the self-evidence then. Well, <laughs> I was floored by it too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, we don't we don't just say "I keep peace and freedom." Yeah, we don't. You know, we say the whole lot of things with it, and they have mm. their own context. So. If there's some particular context you don't understand, perhaps you can to tell us what it is. <laughs> it's fine. Which it's isn't being evasive. It's, it's, uh, I mean, peace is, is peace, and, and that's all it is. And freedom is freedom, and that's all it is. And anarchy is whatever it is. And, and, and that's it. If you set that in the, in the context of the society we live in, or the situation, people in this country found themselves in um, you know, a few years ago and the sort of the way the political machinations and the sort of social machinations that went on um, then they take on an importance but in themselves they I mean they are just self evident. It doesn't actually say anything to um, Just to sort of re restate them, you know, because it's just a, a different way of ending a letter, you know, rather than saying yours faithfully, you say mm -hmm. love or whatever. I think that largely they're definitions which were sort of imposed upon us. I mean, we set out with. Uh, just you know, some songs which we wanted to, some ideas that we wanted to put across, and then became involved in the sort of political arena. And uh, there were both left-wing and right-wing influences who were trying to sort of co-opt what we were saying, um, which was largely why we adopted the anarchy uh, symbol. You know, just as the fuck off to any politicos. Um, and then, you know, then we came up against the established anarchists and their establishment idea of what anarchy meant. And um, as far as we could see, um, putting anarchy and peace together was a complete contradiction to the idea that they had of what anarchy uh, was, which was sort of chaos and uh, no government and um, general violent revolution, which was the opposite to what we were trying to say. So we put up the peace banner together with the uh, anarchy banner, and then the uh, peace movement came along and said, well, you know, their idea of of peace was 
or of creating peace was through um, politics and political demonstration. Um, so uh, freedom came into it as well, individual freedom. <laughs> Uh, and I think that you know they're, they're terms which have, which, which since we started using them, we've been forever trying to redefine and get out of the preconceived uh, 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 meanings that people put on them all the time. And I know that I think that in a way they've. Uh, I don't know in a way that any any form of. Uh, def of definition like that eventually works against itself. Um, I mean, what what difference is there when you see it like that between anarchy, peace, and freedom, and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? I mean, they are sort of similar from that point of view in that they're you know labels which people use, and they don't really make any attempt to understand them. And what we were initially setting out was to say was that, you know, why don't we try and make some attempt to understand each other and the way that we label each other. Um, so it's a, it's just, it's a vicious circle really. And we're also for, forever trying to find uh, interesting ways of explaining it, which don't bore ourselves to <laughs> in, in the process. <laughs> you have explained it. Well, sort of. I mean, I, th yeah. I don't think, I think if you put any label on on what we try and do, then it's a sort of contradiction, because I mean, what we've been trying to say is that uh, people Surely people must be able to live in a way which, uh, uh, in which they can get on with each other and not abuse each other in the way that we seem to do all the time. Well, I think in the last album anyway, we sort of repudiated a lot of those uh, um, things that we created. You know, we, we sort of attempted to cleanse ourselves of the... Um, sort of devils that we've created, you know, but I mean, like the anarchy is just another way of, you know, asking for temperance or, you know, it's just another institution, you know, and there's a lot in the last album that sort of says, well, you know, we don't identify with that anymore. If this is what it's come to mean, then we don't want anything to do with it. Um, you know, at, at, there was a time when, as Andy said, where, you know, we adopted those particular terms to explain what we were doing, but as those terms became translated by other people, so they became less and less applicable to what we, to the, to the reasons why we had adopted them. Um, just as the peace badge, I mean, when we first uh, flew a peace badge above the stage, um, CND had virtually ceased to exist. I mean, there was hardly any peace movement in this country that one knew about. And therefore, when it was flown, it wasn't really seen as CND. It wasn't seen as anything except the old peace badge. And we were attacked by the various music papers for being old hippies because we were flying a peace badge. Um, whereas now to fly it immediately means that you are affiliated to CND. I mean, it's actually lost its peace um, property and it's become CND, which uh, you know there's a general feeling that CND has now increasingly become a sort of political and fairly ineffective political tool. Um, you know, so basically, it's not such a good flag to fly anymore. Um, and we're in a predicament. We can't just with we we wouldn't want to withdraw from all of those positions totally, because obviously they're ones in which we partially believe, but um, because we are being increasingly forced into being that and that alone, you know, so we had to in some way or other sort of withdraw from, to some degree from them.
the album, yes sir, I will. It seemed, it seemed to me just um, like a, a pamphlet. That's the way I you mean I understood it. How do you mean the pam a pamphlet? Well, I mean the old meaning of a pamphlet, but it's um, something you, you write and you give away to people just because you have no other way of expressing it as a form of reject, rejection of something and the right to talk about something you want to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I think in the sense that we have available to us what in the 60s people had small presses and they used to produce leaflets mm. about things and that was the way of sort of sending out information. I mean, basically speaking, that's what Yes Sir I Will was to an extent. You know, was, we've got a greater access. We can put things onto vinyl where other people, particularly 10, 15 years ago, used to do everything on mimeograph. Um, in that sense, it's a leaflet. But then in that sense, everything we've done is a leaflet. Maybe more Yes Sir I Will than the others, because Anyway, it was conceived in a different way. It is, there, there, there was no, there is no particular set of songs in it. You know, the usual boundaries between one song and another. So even think, if there are tapes in between. Yeah, but I think that's because the boundaries increasingly ceased to have any particular relevance. I mean, prior to the Falklands War, um, you know, one sort of naively believed that there were sort of separations between this and that, and if you dealt, dealt with this, then you could do that, and then you could go on and deal with that, and then you could go on and deal with that, you know, like songs, you know, each little song had its each little separate thing to deal with and yes sir I will is a statement about the fact that there isn't any separation that it's all one and the same thing that there is no single cause or single idea there's no one else to blame but yourself um, that you can't sort of say well let's now concentrate on the Northern Ireland problem and that let's now concentrate on the problem of um, sexual relationships, let's now, you can't do that, everything is one major problem and the, and the analysis in Yes Sir I Will is that that major problem stems from yourself, the, you know, that you, there is no authority but yourself. Um, so the whole thing is, is designed to sort of demonstrate the absolute interaction of all forms of oppression, that you can't singularize out one particular element and say that's, that <coughs> is the cause of oppression and we'll deal with that and then this will happen because that isn't how it works. Um, which is why any sort of um, blinkered or single issue movement is doomed to failure. It's, I mean, the, the sort of uh, element, I, th I think one of the failings of, uh, or what appeared to be one of the failings of the feminist movement over the last few years was, was its absolute insularity, you know, that it was simply looking in one way at one problem. And in fact, one, it, it appears now that, you know, it is actually moving away from that sort of singular way of looking at things and um, you know so yes sir I will attempt to look at the whole issue and sort of see where one belonged in it and in the end ended up sort of realizing that one belonged in it in the same position as you did in the first place which was yourself. Um,